I welcome you to this, our last study in the Sermon on the Mount. Can you believe it? Uh, thank those of you who have been with us through all 10 of these sessions. Perhaps, perhaps you just caught the last few, but it's been wonderful to be with you. Thank you for being students of God's Word. Thank you for having an open heart. Uh, Jesus will shake up your world. And sometimes we'd probably just prefer to close the book and ignore what he's trying to say. But Jesus is your creator. He's my creator. And he's our savior. And today we're going to see he is also our Lord. In fact, as we conclude the Sermon on the Mount today, this is like Jesus' altar call. He's just finished saying that uh, we ought to do to others what we would want them to do to us. It's sort of a way of paraphrasing what James in the New Testament calls the royal law, or what the Apostle Paul s says sums up all the law and the prophets, which Jesus said he had come to fulfill, and that is simply to love your neighbor as yourself, the second great commandment after loving God. Where's Jesus going to go at this point? Well, we're going to pick it up with verse 13 of chapter 7. And here's the altar call. So here's what you need to do. Enter through the narrow gate. So it's the word enter, that's an invitation to take a step in our lives. Enter in through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. So you have wide and destruction related. Wide's the gate, this is the gate to the kingdom of heaven. He said the wide gate will not lead you to the kingdom of heaven, but to destruction, and many may enter it. But small is the gate and narrow the road. There's the opposite of wide, narrow the road that leads to the opposite of destruction, and that's a life. And surprisingly, only a few find it. So, amazing statement. Now, the idea of there being two roads was not unusual for the Jews of Jesus' time. This was, co this was commonly believed in Judaism. Well, what they didn't believe was that that most people would not make that road. They, they believe that collectively, with only a few exceptions, all of Israel in the end would be saved. Um, and uh, Jesus is shocking them here. He's turning it upside down. And he's saying, actually, the gate, the, it's a pretty wide, easily accessible way to get to the place of destruction. Um, it reminds us of a proverb that's repeated verbatim twice in the Proverbs. There is a way, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. That's the destruction right there. And so this would be the wide way. Some, uh, some scholars and Bible translators understand when Jesus says wide is the gate, that wide uh, equals easy and that narrow equals hard. We see this in an interesting moment in C.S. Lewis's life. He was one of the great, became later in life, one of the great Christian thinkers of the 20th century. But he said, when I finally landed on atheism as a teenager, he said, it was nice. I didn't have to be obedient to anything anymore. And there was no more accountability. Hey, no rules. I could just do what I want. And what I believed is became irrelevant to anything that existed anyway, because there was no God. So I could just choose to believe things that either made me comfortable or made me excited. And this is very much the drift in American culture today, our drift towards what sometimes people call this self-made spirituality. I call it designer spirituality. This kind of spirituality that is not usually difficult. It's the easy way. Hey, no more rules. I don't, I'm not, I don't have to be accountable to anybody. I can only believe what makes me feel happy. And that's the wide way, unfortunately. Now, it's good if you have friends, or you yourself, perhaps. Um, you know, you say, well, I have a spirituality. It's great you have a spiritual hunger. It's great. That, that's a sign there could be an awakening in your heart. But the fact is, you can access the spiritual world in very many ways. But, but, but there's the Holy Spirit and there's God, and that's through Jesus, but there's also the evil, the, the demonic realm of Satan. And, uh, and you walk away from Jesus, you renounce him, 
and you try to access the spiritual world, whether it's the occult or habitual sin or whatever, you access the spiritual world, you're going to access power there too, but it's going to be the power that will destroy you. Jesus' way, however, is the narrow, narrow way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we struggle with that exclusivity of the gospel, but uh, he, 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 here's where Jesus lands us. In fact, he's going to underscore this a little bit more back to the Sermon on the Mount in the next verse, down to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so, it doesn't, you, know, you, can, you can have a spiritual awareness. You can, you can even call Jesus Lord. This is the very first time, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus identifies himself as God. He said, anyone who says to me, Lord, they're connected. Yeah, sometimes people we talk to say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, that's not true. In fact, here's one place he does. Whoever, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he, so he's even making this gate narrower. Like people even come to me and, and call me, who, who is the way, the truth, and the life, Lord. Just because they call me Lord, that doesn't mean they're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father. That's obedience. That's the bottom line. We have a debate, actually, in the Christian world. Like, can Jesus be your Savior, whereby he's forgiven your sin without being your Lord? We often say Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. Jesus ultimately came to save us, yes, but to the end that he would be, he would be the king of, of the kingdom of heaven. He would rule and defeat evil and Satan, and he's, he's bringing his kingdom to our world. He is Lord. And he's saying, you, you know... You, you can sing nice worship songs and gospel songs that have my name in it, but if you don't obey me, if you don't actually follow me, um, you're still going that easy way. You're just doing what you feel like, and you're not submitting to me as Lord. Many will say to me, in fact, Jesus goes on to say, Lord, Lord, did we not? And, and look at these supernatural uh, words. Prophesy in your name, and in your name, drive out demons, and in your name, perform miracles. And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus is really pressing it here. He's saying you can get so close that at times God will use you. Uh, and he uses you not because you follow me, but because the people you're trying to minister to, um, God loves them so much he'll even use you. But, but you know what? Even miracles aren't the litmus test of whether you're being obedient to the Lord and you're truly submitted to his lordship. Um, it reminds me of Acts 19, the sons of Sceva. It says some Jews went around driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were being demon-possessed. And, and so they, they were driving out evil spirits. I mean, there was something supernatural happening, I guess, but they weren't followers of Jesus. And one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Who are you? And so it comes right back to what Jesus has just said in the Sermon on the Mount. I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. We never want to stand before God in the end, accountable to him. And he will say, now who are you? You always live your life doing your own thing, going your own way. Yeah, you used me when you needed, but you never submitted to my lordship. So what about you? What about me? Have I given my allegiance to Jesus as the actual Lord of my life? Or do I just like being around religious things and being desperate for him once in a while when I'm in trouble? Or is he truly the Lord of my life? Am I living in obedience? And have I moved, in fact, past inspiration and on to obedience? It's one thing to be inspired. It's one thing to hear inspiring music in church on Sunday. It's one thing to hear... Maybe a sermon that inspires you. But the question is, have you moved past inspiration to the place of obedience? When we stand before God, he's not going to say, were you inspired by me? He's going to say, did you obey me? And did you follow me?
so now, now he's going to close the deal. It's the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, anyone, Jesus says, who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So here, here it is. We, we hear Jesus' words and, and you put them into practice. That's obedience. You're like someone who's smart because this is what's, this is what's going to give strength to your life. It's like building your house on a rock. The rains came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house. This could in part speak of life in general. You know, you're just surviving life. But it also speaks of judgment. In the end, there is a judgment coming. Evil is going to be held account. God is going to judge us in our lives. He can't be good if he doesn't hold evil to account and vindicate the innocent. So, so there, there's going to be coming a day where everything is going to be shaken. And the question is, um, are you going to stay standing? He said, if you hear my words and put them into practice, obey them, you'll not fall. You're not going to fall. However, in contrast, just so we don't miss the point, but everyone who hears these words and does not put them into practice, it's like a fool, like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. This is not rock. That's not solid. It's sand. It just gives way. And the rain came, streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. That's what the judgment will be like in the end. And Jesus is actually saying most people will go the self-serving easy way. They're going to go their own way. It's easier not to have rules, not to be accountable to anybody. It's easier to just design a spirituality and a religion that just makes me feel good and fits who I am. As if, as if we have recreated God in our image instead of us being created in his image. But Jesus says there's coming a moment where there is going to be a final word over our lives. And with that, he ends the Sermon on the Mount. And then probably within a couple of years of giving this sermon, he would go to the cross. He would die and he would rise again. And he would make something possible for you and for me. He would make it possible to actually live obediently to God and have that righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees and the scribes. Romans 8, Romans chapter 8, Paul would later put it this way. And we've looked at this verse before earlier in this series. I want to come back to it again. For what the law was powerless to do. That's the Old Testament law. Jesus said, I came. Remember near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. What the law, however, was powerless to do. The law is good, but rules don't have power. You can know what the rules are, but still not keep them. Because the law alone doesn't bring power. Because, because, we're, because of the weakness of the flesh. But, but what the law couldn't do, God did. God did something for you and me by sending his own son, that's Jesus, in the likeness of sinful flesh. He became a human being to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in order that the righteous requirement of the law, remember Jesus said your righteousness needs to exceed that of the religious leaders who just keep external rules. The righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, no flesh, but we live according to the Spirit. That's the resurrection Spirit of Jesus. And that's why we can live obediently to God. He transformed the Jesus situation. He's, he's, he's announcing the coming of the kingdom of heaven. It sets all the rules of this present age on its head and includes those that religious systems exclude, but makes it accessible to every one of us. And in it, he gives us his resurrection spirit. A few verses later in Romans, Paul will say, for if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in us, he will quicken our, or make alive our mortal bodies. Uh, which means in this context, he will help us to be obedient to Jesus. And so may he do it. Here's the final question then. Is Jesus' spirit shaping the life of Jesus in me? Is the spirit of Jesus shaping the life of Jesus in me. 
And if that's the case, then everything that the Sermon on the Mount points to and calls us to can be fulfilled to the glory of Jesus. Thank you for being on this journey through the Sermon on the Mount, and may God bless you.